work it, make it, do it, makes us. My name's Helen Beale. I'm here from Ranger 4. I'm a DevOpsologist. Um, I made up my own job title, which just means that I study DevOps. That's what I audit do all day long. Um, quick question before I start. Who was in the last session about the Phoenix Project story? A few of you. Good. There's a little bit of crossover, so I'll try not to make it too repetitive. I was just sat out the back listening to Brad. It's very, very interesting. But I'm going to talk to you about the DevOps super pattern. So a few more questions before we start. I'm going to assume that most of you are developers, since this is a developer conference. Anyone here from Ops? Any, oh, a few of you, someone not very sure. Um, anyone got DevOps in their job title? A couple of you. Anyone working in a DevOps team? Excellent, so a bit of a mix. OK, so I'm sorry about this slide. I just literally just noticed right now that it got a bit mashed up on its kind of translation to this format. So the funny little bits are years that have got a bit moved around. So. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, and you just heard some of these names in the people that were in the last presentation, you heard some of these names. I always think it's quite fun to talk about where DevOps has come from, because it's quite a big um, buzzword these days, and often people don't know about its provenance. Um, so this guy here, um, Belgian guy Patrick Dubois, really is the, the, the person responsible for this whole thing. Um, and he went to a conference um, in Toronto. This guy, Andrew Schaefer, had put a, a, a talk in or a session that he wanted to talk about Agile system administration. Um, and nobody turned up, um, apart from Patrick. Even Andrew didn't turn up because he thought it was going to be really unpopular. But it really started Patrick thinking. He was like, I really think there's a problem here um, that needs to be resolved. So he started chatting to people about it online, and everyone was very encouraging. Um, and eventually, Patrick got around to kind of committing to setting up um, a conference about it, and that was called DevOps Days. Um, who's been to a DevOps Days in the audience? They run worldwide quite... No one? into DevOps days, okay, you surprised me. Um, they run worldwide now, we've had several in London. Um, the anniversary of Ghent um, happened last year, um, so five years ago. And this whole DevOps thing started as Patrick started a Twitter hashtag um, on DevOps days. So that's where it kind of came from. Things happen after that, like many of you probably have heard about the Flickr thing that happened at Velocity, um, where a guy from Dev and a guy from Ops stood up on stage and talked about how they were doing 10 deployments a day. People were like, wow, that was like really big news back then. Of course, people like Amazon are doing like one every 12 seconds and stuff now. Um, but that was big news then. Time went on, you'll see some technologies popping through. We'll come back and talk about technologies probably in a bit. Um, you'll see the big uh, analysts, so Gartner and Forrester getting involved, and some of the really big vendors having a go at this space as well, so the IBMs and CAs um, also kind of putting DevOps offerings out there. Um, in the previous session, we were very much talking about the Phoenix Project book. Uh, who has read the Phoenix Project? Quite a few of you, great. I mean, it's, if anyone wants to know about DevOps, that's really where we, you, we recommend you start. Um, it is a really easy read, as the other chap said, because it's written like a novel, so you're in a story, there's characters, it's really engaging. Um, that was written by Gene Kim and George Spafford and Kevin Bear. Um, last year in October, Gene um, also produced the DevOps Handbook, written by Patrick, the guy responsible for the whole movement, um, and a couple of other guys, Jez and John, that we'll talk about quite a lot more in a few minutes, particularly John. Um, at Range 4, one of the challenges we've had in our six years of helping people do DevOps stuff is helping people make cultural change. We're all technologists, so actually doing things like building a tool chain might be quite challenging, but it's not as hard for us often as making a movement or moving the needle in culture, um, understanding what our behaviours look like, what our habits look like, the things that are ingrained into the organisations that we work with. Um, another really common use case that we see is, um, and I've actually started almost thinking that DevOps should be called Biz IT because actually I'm seeing more and more conflict between the business and IT, particularly when people are trying to move um, along an agile transformation and the business people are really not getting involved, not committing to um, full-time product owners, things like that. So we're seeing lots of people doing stuff like having product owners by proxy, which are actually BAs, which isn't ideal. It's quite a common use case. Anyway, we were seeing lots of this, um, so we took the Phoenix Project and with our Dutch partner, Gaming Works, who have many, many years' experience writing business simulations, we um, translated the Phoenix Project into a game. So 12 of you can come into a room and you'll each play a role out of the game. Oh, sorry, out of the book. So you could be Sarah, um, head of retail operations. You could be John, the CISO. You could be Bill. 
Um, the game's leader plays the CIO role, and the game runs very like the book. So it starts with the press release, talking about Parts Unlimited, um, talking about the revenue goals and the share prices, and then we run four rounds. And it's a card-based simulation, so the people in the room have to figure out what projects they're doing and what cards and features and actions and things need to be put on the, the work tables. And then at the end of each of the four rounds, we gather up the cards and we score um, the team based on the revenue and share price goals that we'd set at the start. So it's really fun, really interactive, a great way of trying to break down that biz IT barrier. Um, so I heard Brad use a term I use a lot as well. Um, probably we talk about this quite a lot. DevOps has really defied like a, a firm definition. When we're really pushed to say something, we'll say it's about making better software faster and more safely. Um, I do really like this definition, though. This is um, Mark Schwartz. Um, is also published, this book is also published by the same press, IT Revolution, that publishes Phoenix Project and the DevOps Handbooks, basically Gene Kim's press. Um, is anyone going to the DevOps Enterprise Summit in the start of June? No? Okay, it's Gene's event. Um, Mark will be speaking there. He just spoke at CCON a few weeks ago as well. But I really like this definition from Mark's book about um, business value because it talks about a value delivery factory, and that's what we're really trying to create. Um, in IT these days, it's like we're no, we're no longer the people that are running um, an MRP system and a bit of email in a dungeon. Digitization means that we should be leading every organization that we work with. IT doesn't, um, it no longer aligns with the business, it doesn't integrate with the business, IT should be the business. Um, one of our very big customers, Hiscox, and we're very close to Hiscox, they're quite famous in the DevOps world, and again they'll be speaking, it does. Um, their CEO stood up and said, we are no longer an insurance business, we are a technology company. And that's where most organizations we work with are trying to get to. They realize um, how much the world we live in is driven by um, the internet, IoT, smart devices, all of these things. Um, so I mentioned a minute ago about DevOps and it's this kind of resistance to definition. Um, so you're all developers, so I'm sure you're all very familiar with the Agile Manifesto, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, obviously, a very public document. We can all refer to it any day of the week and see what we're doing when we do Agile. Nothing exists in the same way for DevOps, and it's the people that kind of invented it and the, the global market has kind of agreed not to try and pin it down in that way. So what I'm trying to say in this slide is this kind of this balance because we're kind of letting DevOps free to become what it needs to be and not pinning it down. On the other hand, if you're trying to have a sensible conversation with your colleague or someone that's got some budget about what you're doing when you're doing DevOps and what that means and why it's important and why it's going to be of benefit to the business, we do kind of need some stakes in the ground. We do kind of need to make some statements about what it actually is that we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, so this is quite a useful, I call it an elevator acronym. So John Willis, and the John I mentioned is one of the co-authors of the DevOps Handbook, um, originated this acronym quite a few years ago now. Um, anybody come across it before? CAMS? So one hand at the back. It's just really useful. If someone's going, what is this DevOps thing all about? Um, you think of this. And it's the cultural automation, measurement and sharing. Some of you may have cross, come across CALMS as well, um, and you'll see why in a minute I've left out the L, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. So that's kind of where we were, and I was out in, in Munich in December at DevOpsCon, um, and I was doing a presentation that I did quite a few times last year, and apologies, we've lost a little bit of the word here again in the reformatting as I've moved the slides. Um, but that word there says holacracy. Has anybody in the audience come across holacracy to date? A couple of you. So basically an agile organizational management system. Um, last year did quite a few presentations on the correlations between holacracy and DevOps. I started um, at the DevOps Enterprise Summit actually last June um, with another of our customers, Lego, who came over from Denmark to help me with it. Um, and we talked about things like self-organizing teams, distributing authority, um, getting feedback loops, or in holacracy speak, surfacing tensions. Um, and these things like continuous funding, all these things that holacracy likes and DevOps aims for as well. So I was out at DevOpsCon doing this presentation. I'm also quite well known for a phrase that I've stolen off a great friend of mine, Jane Grohl, who runs the ITSM Academy and the DevOps Institute in the United States. Um, called the harmonious polygamous marriage that is DevOps. And the, and the people that are in that harmonious polygamous marriage are agile, ITSM, and lean. So we've been talking about these kind of four things for quite a while. And John Willis, um, the guy responsible for CAMS, um, came up to me and said, 
you've been talking about these things and how there are all these kind of methodologies that are evolving and converging and making the thing that is DevOps. You know, you'll find people talking about DevOps, it's agile on steroids, you know, it's this, it's that. But he said, I've got this thing that I've been talking about, I'm calling it the three-legged stool. And the three-legged stool for John is the learning organization, the safety culture, and the theory of constraints. So we had this conversation, and now I find myself here today. Um, this is probably the fourth or fifth time I've talked on this subject so far this year, this emerging super pattern. So this idea that these many strands are building, if you like, the handbook and the best practices and philosophies that are underpinning what we do when we do DevOps. Um, so <laughs> one of the things I, I didn't mention on this slide, you might not be able to see it that clearly, but there is a watermark on it. Um, the watermark's actually some of our £2 coins. Um, it's not all of our £2 coins, so you might well have one in your pocket or in your wallet. Um, some of them say standing on the shoulders of giants around them. Um, this was originally, came from the Greek, um, when a guy put a servant on his shoulder so he could see further, and then it was, it was used by uh, Newton, and then most famously used by Oasis as, a, um, as their album name. I don't know if any of you remember that, you might not be old enough. Um, there is a story behind that, because apparently Noel was quite drunk when he came up with the name. So if you take a close look at the album cover, you'll see it's actually standing on the shoulder of giants, which, of course, is a little bit grammatically incorrect, because that should be shoulders. Anyway, I digress. Let's talk a bit more about Agile. Um, I expect I know what the answer is going to be to this one. Who in the room practices Agile? Nearly everyone. I thought it was going to be absolutely everyone, but nearly everyone. Um, so you're familiar with this, the Agile Manifesto. Lots of organizations did things in a waterfall manner for a very long time. Lots of organizations still do. Um, it's very painful for a lot of, a lot of people. As you know, there's lots of problems that you'll be aware of. Um, customers ask for things. You give it to them months later, they've changed their mind, or you didn't fully understand what it was in the first place because they hadn't communicated it very well, or you hadn't collaborated very well on it. Things happen, like testing phases are enormous um, and always get squashed because everything else is overrunning. Um, it's very painful doing waterfall, so you know, there's lots of reasons that people want to do Agile. Um, we don't meet all that many people that are doing it that well, still. Um, there's lots of improvement to be made. There's definitely sort of things like um, we've got Scrum very much leading the market. I don't know whether people here have ever tried things like DSDM and some of the earlier um, versions of it. Um, but Scrum doesn't suit everyone in its standard format anyway, so we spend quite a lot of time with people working on how to just adjust things, you know, when the sprint's going to start, when it's going to end, do you need a review, do you need a retrospective as well, can you afford full-time Scrum Masters, can you spread them across different teams, all of these questions that we have to answer when we're trying to manage Agile in our own unique environments. Um, so this gave me the idea of putting... Um, the super pattern into a matrix. I love matri matrices. Um, if you ever get the pleasure of working with me, you'll find that I've got tons of them. Um, we do a lot of assessments with people. I find them really useful to kind of visualize um, where people are and what to do to move up scales. Everyone has different, like, unique places that they are in a matrix, and sometimes it's really confusing because someone's like, oh, I'm a bit at level one and also a bit at level three. Um, so they do need um, to be moderated and customized, but they at least give us a starting point. So here I have my CALMS matrix for Agile. So the things I think Agile has that are very DevOpsy from a cultural perspective are this idea of making everything customer-centric. So um, in DevOps, quite a while we talked about kind of outside in, so really looking from the customer's perspective, and that's what we try and do all the time. Um, when we talk about what a DevOps culture looks like, we want things that are very high trust, very low friction. Um, again, Agile is all about creating that sort of environment. Um, again, this idea of motivating individuals. So um, we kind of like the thought of IT people sometimes as a bit, a bit of a conglomerate mass. And you know, we'll have incidents, and we'll have war rooms, and we'll have post-mortems. And these are some of my least favorite words in IT. I think they're all really unhealthy. Um, and there's definitely a movement that's linked to DevOps. Some people refer to it as human ops or hug ops. Anyone come across those terms? 
But anyway, a movement to kind of reclaim us as individuals and say, actually, we don't have to have a crappy time at work. We should not have to have release weekends where we all have to st st sit by and wait for everything to go wrong. Um, we should be able to do things like release, like breathing. So it should be something we do so frequently and it's so low risk that it just happens. We don't have to do it every month or two to great scare for everybody. So that's really where we're trying to get to. Um, and this idea of behaviour being adjusted as an output of reflection, um, this is very much about feedback loops, and we'll talk about the three ways and the second way in particular in a few minutes. Um, the first principle of the Agile Manifesto, as I'm sure you know, is the continuous delivery of value. Now, this doesn't just necessarily mean from an automation perspective, but that is how most people that I work with interpret it. There is a process element to this as well, but again, it's that value focus that we really like. Um, we're really into measurement in um, DevOps, as you saw, um, and we do this quite well in Agile if you're doing things like sprint burn down. Everybody doing sprint burn downs? Not everyone's putting their hands up. Yeah, not everyone does it, and it's a really important way of us helping um, avoid having the business tell us things like Agile means missed deadlines. Um, we need to help them understand the cadence and velocities that we're working at and what we're delivering. Um, and then sharing, so this is a really important part. This is what um, everything we do in Agile is about. It's about collaborating effectively. Um, there's a, actually the statement about preferring face-to-face -face interaction that's very important as well. And this idea of the team reflecting together. So again, that's another feedback loop. It's another part of the second way. So I particularly like this Agile principle. It kind of crosses over into Lean, actually. So Lean... Um, Lean, we'll go into it in a bit more detail, but Lean is all about removing waste, so it's making everything as simple as possible. I mentioned Hiscox already, but just a, a little note on them. Their main DevOps project that they've won several awards for was called the Da Vinci Project, and they called it the Da Vinci Project because Da Vinci said that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So this idea of removing all this noise and all this waste of stuff that we do. So let's talk a little bit more about Holacracy. I gave you a couple of clues about that in a minute. There is, um, on this slide pack, there is a link to a blog I wrote last year on it. Um, again, this, uh, reflecting back to the talk I did with Lego. Um, so just to kind of summarise what I was saying a minute ago, this is an agile organisational management system, um, and what it's trying to do is distribute authority. So anyone read the State of DevOps reports from Puppet in here? Okay, so they're a really good resource as well. Um, there's the survey for this year's is live at the moment, so it should be out in a couple of months. Um, nearly all of them refer to something called the Westrom um, model of organisational maturity. Everybody come across that, Westrom's organisational model? So it kind of talks about moving from sort of command and control in uh, organisational structures to, behave, to bureaucratic um, structures to what they call generative. So basically trying to... Um, give people more autonomy. So if we go back to that thing I was saying about uh, human ops and hug ops and how to make people happy at work, um, there's a really good TED talk by a guy called Dan Pink, um, and it's about how to motivate people at work, and particularly people that work in the kind of industry that we do, so where it's very high knowledge and the work that we deliver is very complex. You know, we're not just folding boxes. Um, we're doing very long-term, um, complex projects. Um, and actually, just giving us cash rewards or external or, or extrinsic rewards like that isn't very effective for people like us. What's really effective is to create environments where we feel autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And that gives us lots of intrinsic rewards, which make us very happy and make us very productive and make us want to stay. And actually, staying in the same job is very important because one of the big costs for organisations is the turnover of staff, having to replace staff, having to onboard staff, um, all the disruption that goes with that. So... Um, your employers will be, will be happy if you're happy. Um, does get us into an interesting conversation financially with people. So if we try and say to people, if you do DevOps, you're going to make your people happy, 10% happier, which means they're going to be 5% more productive, and then that means X million on your bottom line. And that kind of conversation doesn't really work. But we'll talk more about the kind of benefit statements people are looking for um, around DevOps later. Um, so, yeah, we've got this idea of giving people autonomy, and what we're basically saying that is we're giving um, kind of people more authority to do um, their job. Um, my favourite example of this, which isn't actually a tech um, example, is actually Waterstones. So, Waterstones were nearly 
bust when they were part of HMV. They got bought by a Russian billionaire who fortunately thought books were a bit cooler than football clubs. So that was good. Um, and then he gave the CEO role to a guy called James Daunt. And James Daunt runs a number of bookshops in London. Anybody been to them? Yeah. He basically graduated from Cambridge or Oxford or somewhere and was going to be like a financial trader. And his wife told him that he wasn't, she wasn't that keen on the idea. So he opened a bookshop instead. And it was quite a unique um, proposition that he had. So he made it more by geography. So you'd go in and there'd be like an Australia section. There'd be Australian cookbooks and travel books and novels by Australians and poetry by Australians. Um, and it's been quite a popular little bookstore. I think there's 10 or 15 in London. Um, but the stock market was a bit disturbed when this Russian billionaire decided to give James um, the CEO role of Waterstones. But he's been incredibly successful, and really the key to his success was that he stopped telling all of the stores what to put on the shelves and what to put in the windows, which was a very brave thing to do as well, because quite a bit of the Waterstones income was from charging publishers premium prices to have those spaces to put their books on. What he did is he told the people in the stores that he wanted them to get to know the local market and accordingly stock the shelves um, and sell um, directly to them on recommendation and on the conversations they were having. So they became these fantastic sensors or this amazing feedback loop. So that's really the kind of thing that Holocaust is um, trying to do. So it's trying to um, get us, um, in your case, the developers, much closer to that feedback loop with your customers. Um, I know from the developers that I talk to that you're really proud of the work that you do and you really want to know that it's well received and you would really like feedback um, to make improvements. And really in DevOps, we're trying to get there. So if you hear things, um, people that are talking about DevOps say ridiculous things like, oh, just give the developers a pager. A, you can laugh because we haven't seen pagers for many decades. Um, and B, that's really not what this is about. It's not about punishing developers for throwing code over the wall to ops and expecting them to support it. It's about getting ops more involved in the process earlier and having some um, inputs into your product backlog and having some conversations with you about when you might want to release something and what that's going to look like and the kind of gates you need to go through. I digress slightly. Um, automation. The guys that actually came up with Holacracy are all, all ex-agile practi practitioners themselves from a software development perspective. So there are a lot of similarities. Um, and they've used things like GitHub quite extensively in the way that they deliver Holacracy as well. And they have a, a specific tool called Glassfrog. Um, and it's called Glassfrog because the idea of Holacracy is instead of having um, that hierarchy, that classic hierarchy, um, when you go into Glassfrog and you try and represent your organization, it actually looks like an organism with organs and cells. So it's a very cellular kind of circle um, representation. So you don't get, well, that person's higher than that person, that one's more superior than that person. You get that there are a lot of interdependencies across the whole organization. Um, so yeah, this idea of measurement, everyone's a sensor. A couple of things I really love about Holacracy as well. It doesn't do any sales targets. It doesn't have any budget. So it has this idea of continuous funding. And continuous funding is a really key thing in the agile space. Um, most organizations still budget annually. So there's a 12-month cycle where you spend two or three months sitting down and telling people what you think you might want to spend in the next 12 months. Does that make any sense when we're trying to deliver things in two-week sprints? doesn't to me. So... Um, last year, when I was at DOS, a guy called John Smart from Barclays was talking, and he said, he made a statement on stage, he said something like, I've gone from 5% to 50% of my strategic change projects to Agile in the last year. And I said, that's brilliant. How are you funding them? He said, ah, we've moved to a rolling quarterly wave of funding. So he'd taken that first step, so instead of doing it annually, because if you're setting a budget in October, it could be spent like the following February, I mean the year following February, so 14 months later. So like if we're talking about changing requirements, things do change, it's far too long a time. Anyone doing continuous funding in the room? Rolling quarterly wave? Every, one rolling quarterly wave, everyone else on annual funding still? Yeah, a few nods, it's painful. Um, and then lots of, you know, share, sharing and holacracy are, again, just natural bedfellows. Everything about holacracy is about doing peer review. Um, everyone in the room have at least one change approval board that they need to go through to get a change? Yeah. Anyone have no cabs? All peer review? That's quite a high count in this room. You're lucky guys, because we only have one of our customers that can do it, which is Lego. Um, but that shows that you have very high trust um, built into your organization, so great work. Um, so this 
This, um, I first learned about holacracy. I read a book called Reinventing Organisations by Frederick Lally, and that's what started me on my holacracy path. And this comes from the book. So change becomes no longer a relevant topic because it's just something that's always happening. So it's not like, oh, we're going to make a change. It's just that like everyone knows there's change. That's changing, that's change. It's just normal. It's like breathing, like I said earlier, making a release process like breathing. ITSM, probably not a favourite topic of most people in the room. Any ITIL practitioners here? Yay! Gosh, you cover everything, don't you? Yeah. Um, so ITIL got itself a really bad name. Um, it wasn't really its fault, but it was partly its fault. But they had this bright idea of writing this really comprehensive book of telling you like every way you could do everything. And everyone kind of took the book and went, right, let's do it that way. And it was meant to be much more customised than that, but it became very unpopular. Um, and ITSM kind of replaced it. ITIL also got bought by Axelos to part capital. It's all quite complicated. But, but generally, what we're trying to do when we do ITSM is the more safely part. So we're trying to put some governance around and process around the way that we do things like instant management, problem management, asset management, uh, change management, all the managements that operations need to do so that people have expectations and, and they know um, what to do. And also, if you're on, onboarding new staff, for example, you want them to be um, able to figure out quite quickly what to do if, if something happens. Um, but we're really doing away with ITSM um, these days, and we're talking about something called ASM. So ASM is Agile Service Management. So what we've been doing is we've been taking the IT operations teams in the companies that we work with and teaching them basically Scrum, basically how to design ITIL or ITSM processes using sprint methodologies. So um, making that change happen a lot more quickly, making it um, more frequent as well. Um, and this has gone down quite well. We're still working out with organisations where the model shifts completely because another thing you can do, which I kind of referred to earlier, is you can embed ops into your product teams, so into your agile teams. Um, I did a piece of work very early on at Range 4 when I was trying to understand if there was sort of a standardised ratio between dev and ops in organisations, and it turns out there just isn't. Um, it gets really complicated because some people outsource development, some people outsource ops, some people outsource testing, and there's just a huge variation. Um, but it makes it difficult for us to make like a standard recommendation to people like, oh, the best way to do DevOps is to put an ops person in every Agile team because that just doesn't work. Like the, the maths doesn't work for a lot of organizations. So we have to find cleverer ways of doing it. Um, and this is one. This is one by teaching the ops people how you're working when you're doing Agile and how to line up, how to use a product backlog. You know, they can start contributing to your product backlogs potentially as well with their NFRs. You know, it's a big moan from ops that we hear a lot. Oh, they don't, I never get my NFRs in. You know, and the other big one, oh, God, they expect me to do a release and I haven't heard anything about it. Well, if they're involved in the sprint, they'll know that's coming through. Um, and they'll probably understand the need for doing things like cloud or automated environment provisioning or automating deployment in a way that you can have more of a handle on it and link it to your continuous delivery pipeline in, more, in better ways. Um, so, yeah, this is a, we have a course. In fact, we have two courses um, for this. One is the Agile Service Manager, which is the ops equivalent of Scrum Master, and the other is Agile Process Owner, which is the operational equivalent of uh, Product Owner. And this is from the course. You know, if your requirements are changing, then your support capabilities need to be changing fast as well. So culturally, um, what we're trying to do is get this just enough governance. So you know about just enough. This time we're trying to get just enough governance. So we're trying to rip out um, processes that have got really heavy and bureaucratic and are really annoying for everybody and make everything light to touch whilst protecting you if you're in a high, highly regulated industry. So... I'll just take an example. We work with um, a, a smaller company that we work with called Barnick Wad Waddingham, um, who are actu actu I really struggle to say this, actuarial accountants, basically do pensions, much easier to say. Um, and they um, introduced something called a release checklist. And it was introduced to help with their ISO and to help with their regulation. Um, only problem was it created a massive bottleneck. And we've kind of realised it was actually a bit more of a, a symptom rather than a disease itself and the, the disease it was showing us was actually that 
um, ops weren't integrating that well into dev. They weren't controlling their product backlog. They weren't doing things like the definition of done very effectively. They weren't finding user stories very well. They weren't doing sprint reviews. They weren't doing sprint res retrospectives. There were lots of things that were contributing um, to the fact that they felt that they needed this very clunky um, release checklist. But by bringing everyone together um, in a room, which we did a couple of weeks ago in a workshop, we actually made some really good headway to tackling those underlying parts that needed um, to change in order to remove that thing. Um, automation, loads of service desk tools out there, um, some more popular than others. Does anyone use Snow or ServiceNow in the audience? Remedy, Jira service desk. Yeah, so lo not a lot of hands going up, so I'm suspecting that some of you may not know that much about what the service desk tools are being used. Um, I heard Brad, I think, mention um, Jira, or Atlassian at least, earlier on. Um, Atlassian have three Jira products, Jira Software, Jira Core, and Jira Service Desk. Jira Service Desk is a relatively new addition to the family to recognize that lots and lots of people are using Jira to manage their service desk, so they may as well provide a platform specifically built with that. It's really, really powerful because you can get something on your support desk and send it straight into your... Um, it, it has the same ticket number as it goes into your developer Jira. So you get a full loop, you get full visibility, and it really helps the communications between um, the support desk and developers. You know, th that thing I said, the stupid thing about, oh, give the developers a pager, that's how it should look, that, you know, support of getting the call and having a conversation that's traceable with the developers about it. Um, we love SLAs um, when we're doing service management. So, you know, how long are we going to respond by? How long are we going to fix it by? Never going to guarantee that, right? But all of those kind of things. Um, and then ASM really um, does differ from ITSM and uh, ITIL because what we're trying to do is promote that cross-pollination between your two teams. So we're trying to train the IT ops people to learn the language that you're using when you do Agile every day so you have a common vocabulary. So let's talk about Lean for a minute. Um, touched on the DevOps handbook earlier on. We were really pleased when this came out because we'd been using this lean tool called Value Stream Mapping for quite a while to help people on the DevOps journey. So normally when people come to us and say, we want to do DevOps, but we're not sure how, how do we start? We'll say, we'll start with an assessment because we love metrics, so we need to baseline your current state, and from that we can start to articulate your future state, and from that we can develop a roadmap which will give you the key constraints or key things you need to tackle to move forward and move up the maturity la layers of some of my favorite matrices. Um, so we're very delighted when DevOps Handbook came out and it had a lot of focus on value streams. Has anyone in the room done value stream mapping? One, I think. So um, we're going to come, no, we're not going to come to this, I'll, I'll cover it here. Um, all of the lean stuff came out of Toyota. Um, so the Phoenix Project book was written um, not as a sequel, but kind of a rewrite of a book by a guy called Elijah Goldratt, who wrote a book called The Goal. And this is all linked to what we learned at Toyota about lean manufacturing um, and just in time and all of these kind of things. Value stream mapping is different from process mapping. People get them qu quite confused sometimes. Value stream mapping is like a very high level looking at the path it takes to one of your products or services from the moment of conception all the way through to the customer receipt of it. Whereas a process, it has lots of little processes. So when we do value stream mapping, what we're really looking at is the handoffs between processes. So if I give you an example of one we did at uh, MasterCard. Um, so MasterCard were... Um, part of their payments unit were ring-fencing uh, one of the banks. So, as you probably know, as a result of the credit crunch, all the banks had to ring-fence their investment and retail banks, they had to separate them um, as part of the... Um, basically to protect us if there was another one and, the, and all of the money was tied up in trading. Um, it meant that your money would be safe. Um, and we value stream mapped this thing for them, and it involves getting a load of people in a room that don't often get in a room together and have probably never thought about the end-to-end -end thing, and spending a couple of days looking at the current state and a couple of days um, on the future state. And we looked at this thing, and we discovered it had taken them 364 days to deliver this project. Um, and when we looked at it more, and we realized that there were eight cabs involved at the front end, and that there was no automated environment provisioning, and that they tried to deliver the main bit of software in a, on a very waterfall manner, manner, when we ripped it apart and took out those things, we got that down to 89 days, which sounds quite astound astounding, 364 to 89. But in fact, when we look at waste and process in this, in this way, that's not an unusual proportional saving. Um, so we love lean. Um, 
when you read the Phoenix Project, you'll probably remember the bit when Bill gets everyone in a room and they put all the post-its up on the walls. Um, so that's quite reflective of Kanban. Which of you are using Kanban in the room? So quite about a third to half of you, yeah. So, you know, there's loads of long conversations we can have about Kanban and scrum boards and whip limits and all of these things that kind of differentiate and work for different people and, and not for other people. But um, one of the things Bill was doing when he got everyone in that room, um, he was trying to understand uh, the amount of technical debt that the organisation had and the amount of rework that was going on in the organisation. Does anyone in the room work for an organisation where you actually record the amount of rework that you're working on or unplanned work? No, it is quite rare, but it's a really one, one over there. It's a really powerful metric, and um, particularly if you feel that you're in an environment where you do have a lot of technical debt, which is stopping you deliver the innovation, because you'll need a reason to throttle the change a little bit to give yourself a chance to tackle the technical debt. Um, the other thing that people find it really hard to justify to business people is building some automation. It's like, you can't take two weeks out to build a or to write an automated test. I just need you to be testing. And you're like, yeah, but once I've written that automated test, it's going to take that test 10 minutes to run instead of four hours. But it's quite hard sometimes to have those conversations. Lean's all about all of that kind of stuff. So again, we've got this huge focus on the customer with Lean, um, which is very much what DevOps is all about. Um, automation, as I just said. We want to get rid of errors, we want to get rid of duplication, we want to get rid of rework. Um, things like automated deployment, where people are using lots of scripts, or um, we work with lots of very large organisations where they have very large outsourced teams to um, SIs, and they do things like give the SI a 140-page manual on how to install WAS or Web Application Server, um, which goes wrong nearly every time as that person leaves through the pages. So these kind of manual errors are things that we're really trying to get rid of when we go lean from an automation perspective. I mentioned Kanban there. Again, we mentioned Sprint Burndown already. Anything like that that can help us measure velocity um, to help us expose the waste and, and measure improvements is really useful. Um, really big thing in DevOps is about celebrating success as well. So this is another reason why the measurements are really important to us, because how do we know if we're doing well unless we've got a goal that we can measure against? Um, that's a bit of a worry. I think I might have just pressed the wrong button. Phew. Um, so just a little more on the metrics. So um, I mentioned rework a couple of times just then. Um, one of the big things that we use when we're doing value stream mapping is this concept of percentage complete and accurate. So one of the things we work on when we do a value stream map is trying to understand as the work goes downstream, whether it's received by the next manufacturing unit, if you like, or the next person in the delivery chain, um, how much of it is right. And then the other things that we're really using is about kind of elapsed time um, and actual working time. So there's kind of three key metrics that we use that allow us to uncover this waste. So a bit about the learning organisation. This chap, Peter Senge, is quite, um, quite famous in this space. Um, you're all reading that, I'm sure. I always read that and feel just a little bit nauseous. I, I feel like it's a bit, a bit too utopic. And considering I spend the vast majority of my time helping people identify future states and fit ways to get to them, I still feel that this one is like way off for a lot of people we work with. Um, everyone familiar with Google 20% in the room? So a few hands up. Um, the idea is that you should get 20% of your time to spend on learning, basically. So you could call it every Friday or whatever it is. Most organisations that we work with don't have that luxury. Um, most of them are A, too busy firefighting technical debt, B, too busy trying to get all the innovation through that the business is asking for, and C, might be thinking about trying to do some extra learning but just not managing to get it in around those other things. Um, but this is what we should be aiming for. But as I say, it just makes me feel it's just a little bit utopic for my tastes. So I've also mentioned Phoenix product quite a lot. I mentioned the three ways. This is how we present or represent the three ways. So first one is about flow, so very much a lean thing um, and an agile thing. Second way is about feedback loops, um, so very much about kind of measurement and getting responses from your customer. So in agile, that's about you know, doing your, um, your showcasing and your demos on your sprint reviews, getting that early feedback. Um, and then the last one is about experimentation and learning. Um, that's the most difficult one for people to get to. So again, to put learning organization into this uh, matrix, 
Um, a learning organisation is trying to do this again. So we've seen this already with Holacracy um, and with Agile, this idea of decentralising the role of leadership. Um, so really trying to give power back to the people, if you like. That's not too cheesy a phrase. But um, certainly in IT um, organisations, we have a, a very high proportion of talent. Um, and in quite a few organisations, we see a lot of that talent wasted as people don't properly harness it because they try and tell everybody what to do rather than allowing people to bring some of their own creativity to the party. Um, and then we've got an idea of cultural debt with learning organisations as well. So um, every day that we don't learn, we're building cultural debt into our organisation, basically, because we're putting ourselves behind the competition um, that are probably getting better. So every time that we firefight, we're costing ourselves more money just than the time of firefighting. We're costing ourselves our future in terms of getting better. So it's really important to try and get to a place where we can have learning as part of what we do on a daily basis. Um, I left measurement blank, so I actually couldn't find much. So I'm always looking for feedback and always trying to continually improve myself. So if anybody thinks, oh, that should go in there, please do let me know, or any other feedback is very welcome as well. Um, and then the sharing thing, I like this idea of exposing personal mental patterns. I think that's thing, something we're not very good at doing in IT. It sounds a bit foreign to me, but um, it does sound like quite a good idea, kind of helping us understand the way that our brains work and um, the way that we can share ideas from that. And moving on to the safety culture. So this is the newest one. This is relatively new. This is Chernobyl, in case none of you can recognise this. And this is the thing that really caused this to become a kind of phrase that people use and a thing that people are trying to um, document and, and structure around. Um, you see things like this. This isn't one of my favourite maturist models. It's too simple. It's not a matrix. <laughs> um, but you see things like this. You know, People are trying to understand what does it mean to become safer. So for most organisations we work with in IT, that means... Um, but particularly with things like GDPR, GDPR coming along, I don't know if many of you caught the, um, the malware thing that happened at Debenhams a week or so ago, and they lost 26,000 customer details over a couple, six weeks, I think the malware was running. So if that had happened next year when GDPR had come in, I think we worked out the other day, um, I've got a, a very close friend who works at Akamai who specialises in security, it's going to cost them something like half a billion or something in, in fines because of the things that went on. Um, so, you know, there's a huge amount of regulatory risk, huge amount of fine risks around privacy data and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, so, we want things to be safe. We've got all this cyber security stuff. So, actually, yesterday I was in Belfast. Um, I was talking at um, an OWASP conference about what is a DevSecOps engineer. Um, I spent a lot of time ch chatting about security for a couple of days. Um, and the scary things that people do to us and the fact we're being attacked all the time, what can we do about it? Um, and this is really where we have to be. So you remember the third way we were talking about, which was about experimentation and learning. We talk to people a lot about failure. Um, when we do our assessments, one of the questions, in fact, two of the questions we ask is we ask one, um, how do you feel about failure? And the other one that we ask is, um, do you feel like you're constantly dancing around the edge of failure? And people are quite mixed on those questions. Um, failure is often seen as a bad thing, particularly if you work in a, an organisation that's led by fear. But in DevOps, we like to embrace failure. Um, I don't think I've got it in this presentation, but um, yesterday I had some slides from a recently opened Museum of Failure in Sweden, which features some very interesting products, some of which you'll be very familiar with, like Google Glasses. Um, some you'll be less familiar with, probably, like the beef lasagna-flavoured toothpaste. Um, so people come up with these wild and wacky ideas of, of products and things to try. Um, and Lego, again, actually have a, an annual award for the most failed IP project, and it's intended to recognise that people are trying to be innovative. So in DevOps, we want you to be innovative. We don't want you to be afraid of failure, but we also have to protect you from causing a ca catastrophic failure that could cost your business um, its livelihood or lots of fans. So we have these sayings that you're probably familiar with, fell safe, fell fast, fell often, fell smart. So we have ways in which in DevOps we want to build resilience into your systems and recoverability into your systems that protect you um, when you're experimenting. Everyone heard of Chaos Monkey? So Netflix, Chaos Monkey, yeah, loads of things that we can do to keep on testing your systems to build resili resilience in. Um, this is from the DevOps Handbook. Uh, we use this as part of our standard course material, actually, for our DevOps Foundation course. Um, I haven't met, really, hardly any organisations that cover all of this yet, and actually the one that I see most people slipping up on is about the security libraries and the security scanning tools, which is what we were talking about yesterday. So 
um, the ability to do things like either have a security tool that's built quite seamlessly into the IDE. So when you pull an artifact out of your artifact repository, whether it's Nexus or Artifact or whatever it is, you can get a little pop-up saying, actually, that version of Struts is a bit dodgy. Would you like to download this one instead? Or if you don't want it to interrupt you in your IDE, you can break it um, at CI or CD and get a, 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 an alert at that point. Heard about some great stuff yesterday called RASP, uh, Real-Time Application Security. I uh, can't remember what the P was, but basically sitting in your JVM so and protecting you live in your JVM from SQL injections and stuff. It was, very, it was the first I'd heard of it. It was very cool. So I'm going to try and hurry up because I know that I haven't got much more time. Um, one of our partners, Sonotype, who do some tools, um, they made Nexus actually in Maven. Um, they did a DevSecOps survey just a couple of months ago and they found um, this, uh, which was about um, basically when people are automating security and what we'd like to see is all of this coming left and actually if you took a little if ignore this one or ignore the throughout the process one at that end if you did like a blue line you'll see there's a kind of a lean there and then if you do a purple line you'll see that it is the overall line is shifting left hopefully that little dance made sense to everyone but what we in an ideal world we'll be seeing all of this coming earlier so um, the idea of the DevSecOps engineer is that, like DevOps isn't one person's job, it's everyone's job. Security is as well. So what we'd like to see is developers being, a, being helped by security to understand more about what it means to build security into their applications, um, more collaboration. Security are the worst, frankly, in, in the IT world. And it, we work with some customers where they don't even report into IT when they very clearly should. Um, but really the worst for collaborating. They're very risk averse. They're very good at putting up barriers. Um, is there anyone from security in the room? I've just realized I've gone on a bit of a rant. Oh, good, I haven't offended anyone. Um, so yeah, they very often sit in their ivory towers and they're quite like um, unhelpful because they just want to make sure that their um, bum is covered. Should anything go wrong? So to finish off on this matrix, um, safety culture. It's about culture. It's got culture in the name. So a bit of a giveaway there. Um, but we need to build safety in um, into these um, highly experimental environments that we want to aim for. So MTTR, classic measurement we use there, um, and accountability being key. So theory of constraints, very last one, um, very much part of the goal that I mentioned earlier. Um, the idea of the theory of constraints is very much around manufacturing. It is out of the um, Toyota thing again. So if you imagine a, a manufacturing pipeline, um, there's this idea that if you make an improvement that's not a, a constraint, it's just an illusion. So if you imagine work flowing, you're basically either creating more work going up to another bottleneck or you're creating a vacuum under the actual bottleneck. Um, we use it as a tool when we're trying to prioritise things on a, on a, for example, an improvement roadmap, trying to, trying to surface the highest priority constraints. This one just gives you like a feel for how long these things have been going on in terms of like how long people have been trying to um, codify them, if you like, or have been talking about them and documenting them. So um, Agile, I can't remember the name, the ski resort. It's after a bird, like Snowbird or something. There's a ski resort in Utah where they came up with the Agile Manifesto anyway in sort of the early 1990s. Locracy very new. ITSM started with our government here in the UK, as I said, been bought by Axelus now. The oldest by far is Lean, coming out of Toyota. Um, Newish learning organization, much newer safe, uh, safety culture, and then we've got the gold, they've got the gold wrap books there. I put a little globe up there because I thought it's quite nice, isn't it? We've got some coming out of America and some coming out of the UK and some coming out of Japan and some coming out of Russia. It's quite, quite nice to see that kind of global element to it. This again is kind of my first kind of go at trying to go right. Which of, the, which of the three ways is this one really concerned about? So it's just a little matrix that says, this one looks like that. So for example, you can see that I've thought here, hmm, learning organization, not really about flow, but very much about experimentation learning. Just might be useful tools for you if you're having these conversations with people. So just to finish off, um, DevOps is all about change. Change is quite hard to do, even though it's actually happening all the time. Um, these are the reasons why we think uh, everyone wants it. So if you ask anybody who wants change, everyone's like, yeah, let's change, let's, let's improve. Ask people if they want to change. So oh, no, I'm actually fine, thank you very much. I'll just go over here. Ask this one, <laughs> who wants to lead it? Everyone runs off. It's very scary being a change leader. Most of our um, kind of initial touch points into organizations are people that have the, the courage, motivation, the enthusiasm, the stupidity, whatever you want to call it, um, to want to lead a change program. 
Uh, Brad talked about this, but well, not actually this, but he talked about the iron triangle that we've always talked about in IT. So this idea that you can't um, have thing that's something that's very low cost and high quality um, at high speed. You're always going to have to compromise one of those three things, quality, speed, um, and time. Sorry, quality, speed, and cost. Um, I was having a conversation with someone on LinkedIn, and it got a bit out of hand, and we kind of invented this thing called the Golden Square. And basically, it's, it's saying that with DevOps, the idea is that we can deliver things at low cost, at high speed, at high quality, and we've got this fourth dimension um, of the human ops element, so the customer delight or the employee delight part of it. So to summarize, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do ideation to realization. Um, what we're trying to do is just shrink that spring when we're doing DevOps. We're trying to take as much waste out of the process, automate as much as we can, take as much friction out, um, and just get you delivering value to your customers as quickly as possible um, through a continuous release lifecycle. So that's me with one minute to go. I am here for questions if you've got any. Um, hopefully you don't all look too baffled. Hello. Uh, I'm interested about how things like DevOps and how things like Agile work at scale. Yep. What you make of things like SAFE and the yep. scaled Agile framework. What do you, what's your, what do you rate it? Do you, what's your take on it? So. And how these things can work in a massive organization. Can you hear this okay? No, you need. Okay, so the question was, um, this gentleman was interested in um, our opinions on uh, how Agile can scale, particularly frameworks like SAFE. Um, I'm not an Agile consultant myself. I have many I work with. I kind of do the whole umbrella DevOps thing. Um, what I hear from my customers and our consultants is that there's quite a lot of divided opinion about things like SAFE. Um, it can work well, like Scrum, when it's executed well and customized according to um, the organization. People like Lego use it quite extensively. And I think, I mean, it is hard for an organization, isn't it? If you've got tens of product teams and, you, and they might be working across different lines of one product to be separated all the time. On the other hand, it seems really difficult to get hundreds of people in a room for a few days to, to kind of do the kind of things that SAFE is asking us to do. So short answer, mixed and challenging. Um, but a conversation, we'd be very happy to continue with you if you wanted to, to get some more details. Anyone else with any questions? Is it coffee break time? Yeah. Cool. Thanks very much for listening, guys. Cheers.